Very good. Well, good evening and welcome to the first installment of the Higgin History Center Spring 2021 Speaker Series. I'm Jeff Sherry, Museum Educator at the Higgin History Center. Our speaker tonight is Mr. Brian Gorman, Vice President of Operations at Waldemere Water Park, Water World. This year, Waldemere celebrates its 125th anniversary of entertainment and amusement for our region. Before I turn it over to Brian, just a few announcements from the Hagen History Center. We are currently closed to the public due to the pandemic, but we are working to complete new exhibits in our new exhibit building, and as well as those exhibits in the Watson Curtsy Mansion and the Wood Morrison House on our beautiful West 6th Street campus. We plan to open again in late spring of this year. Our staff has created many blogs, and videos that are available on our website at www.eriehistory.org. And we encourage you to check those out on a regular basis. In conjunction with the Jefferson Education Society and the Erie Civil War Roundtable, please join us for a presentation on General George Gordon Meade, the victor of Gettysburg by me, Dr. Sherry, on January 25th at 7 p.m., also via Facebook and also, Jeff Bloodworth will be the last speaker in January. Again, a university professor, he will speak on January 28th at 7 p.m. for perspectives on the 2020 election and subsequent events. Our speaker tonight, Brian Gorman, is Vice President of Operations at Waldemere and Waterworld and has grown up in the amusement business starting when he was 12 years old. He has worked summers at his family park throughout high school and college, had the positions in almost every area of the park. After attending Miami University and graduating with a BS in marketing, he returned to Waldemere as Riot Operations Manager in 2009. Since then, he has moved on to his current position as Vice President of Operations and oversees every aspect of the park's daily operations. Currently, he is serving as president of the Pennsylvania Parks and Attractions Organization. He also served on the International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions, IAAPA, Parks and Attractions Committee. He's a former member of the local, is, is a member of the local Rotary Club and a chairman of Visit Erie Tourism. When he is not working, Brian enjoys raising his two children Charlie and Rosie. Brian. Thank you, Jeff, uh, for the introduction and inviting me to talk tonight. Um, I'm excited to share with everyone the wonderful history of Waldemere. And even better, I get to do it wearing sweatpants in my own home. Uh, but all joking aside, I appreciate the opportunity from the Hagen History Center and hope uh, you enjoy learning a little bit about Waldemere tonight. As most of you know, Waldemere is family owned and operated and has three generations working at the park. In this photo from your left are my mother and father, Steve and Nancy Gorman, my wife, Allison, myself, and my mother's parents, Paul and Lane Nelson, who are the current owners of Waldemere. Since this photo was taken, my wife has left the park and started her own business, but the rest of us remain working to keep Waldemere's tradition alive. Waldemere has such a unique and rich history many people are unaware of. You may know Waldemere is old or your grandparents may have brought you to the park when you were younger, but the park story and that of amusement parks in general holds much more, which is where I have decided to begin, at the beginning of outdoor amusements and the birth of the modern day amusement park. Between 1500 and the early 1800s, Pleasure gardens spread across Europe as a means for people to escape the dreary conditions of cities and enjoy the many attractions, including landscaped gardens, live entertainment, fireworks, games, and even predecessors to modern day Ferris wheels, carousels, and roller coasters. In the late 1700s, the United States was an emerging nation of its own. And as it grew, so did simplified versions of the European pleasure gardens. Box Hill Gardens in New York City, pictured here, opened in 1767 and featured one of America's first carousels. The industry continued to flourish after the Civil War, 
when the Industrial Revolution was sweeping the nation, people flocked into growing cities, creating conditions like that of Europe, crowded and dreary. These cities, connected by America's growing transportation infrastructure, made it easier to travel, and those with increasing amounts of money needed a place to spend it and to escape the crowded conditions of the city. The first developers of amusement parks were railroads, which sought to increase traffic by creating amusement parks on the outskirts of cities. Even steamships established parks on waterways and coastlines to build traffic. But the invention and spread of the trolley line truly established the amusement park as an American icon. When the first electric power street rail car opened in Richmond, Virginia in 1888, trolley car companies seemed to pop up across the nation almost overnight. To maximize traffic on evenings and weekends, operators opened amusement parks at the end of their lines. These parks featured dance halls, picnic facilities, restaurants, games, and rides, and tapped an unmet demand that swept across America. Waldemere was one of those popular picnic areas that was established by the Erie Electric Motor Company. Then known as Hoffman's Grove, the 65-acre parcel on the shores of Lake Erie was dense with chestnut, oak, magnolia, and spruce trees. Aligning with its German heritage, the trolley company named their new venture Waldemere, German for woods by the sea. In addition to picnicking, one attraction that could be found at Waldemere in 1905 was an original carousel featuring hand-carved animals and built by T.M. Harton of Pittsburgh. The building that housed the carousel pictured here still stands today and is the home of Waldemere's current carousel. Other attractions included bowling alleys, a large indoor dance hall, and a Hofbrau beer garden, complete with singing waiters. T.M. Harton also built Waldemere's first roller coaster, the figure eight. Built in 1902, this gentle ride took riders up and down over dips and turns. T.M. Harton built many rides across the country and operated them at various parks, paying rent to the trolley companies that owned the land. But one of the most popular attractions in the early 1900s was Waldemere's Beach and Boardwalk. Known as Erie's Beach Spot, Waldemere Beach was complete with a 110-foot bathhouse, changing stalls, and even offered bathing suits for rent, which was common for that era. The wooded walk down to the beach opened to a natural lagoon and boardwalk, where the boats and canoes were available for rent as well. In the years following World War I, Waldemere saw growth of attractions and attendance. With the establishment of Presque Isle State Park in 1921, beachgoers, however, left Waldemere's Beach to visit the miles of beaches there. But Waldemere's newest stakeholder, Alex Moeller, made changes and added attractions to keep guests happy. Arriving in New York in 1913 from Germany, Alex began selling hot dogs at Coney Island. He made his way to Erie and began selling hot dogs at the park, eventually becoming the general manager and leasing the park from the trolley company. In the late 1920s, with the intention to extend the park to the south, Alex Moeller built a new domed building to house the park's carousel. After just one year, ridership dropped dramatically on the carousel since it was farther away from the park center, and Alex moved the carousel back to its current location. The building that Alex Moeller built still stands today as Waldemere's merry-go-round picnic shelter near the bumper car ride. With the onset of the Great Depression, Waldemere struggled to keep the park operating. To keep guests visiting during this time, the park invested in free entertainment. The most unique attraction was Monkey Island, a playground surrounded by water for rhesus monkeys to climb and play. This attraction was popular well into the 1950s until Waldemere was forced to close the attraction due to a lack of monkeys to repopulate the island. The lack of monkeys was reportedly due to America's newly founded space program. The Great Depression was not the only setback Waldemere faced during this time. In 1924, a fire destroyed the original dance hall on the property. 
Given the popularity of dancing, the park rebuilt the dance hall the following season. Named after the multicolor floor tiles, Rainbow Gardens has hosted names such as the Glenn Miller Band, Friction, and the Moonlighters, and still hosts events to this day. This photo shows Waldemere's Midway in the 1930s, showing the station of the figure eight coaster, known then as the Coney Island Scenic Coaster. At this time, the park was more than just an amusement park though. With Waldemere's beach and cottages, it was a neighborhood in and of itself. A few independent businesses opened uh, on the park property, such as Cooper's Grocery Store and a Creamery. The Coopers lived above their establishment and operated the games in the park. Iconic Waldemere rides were introduced in this era as well. The mill chute, pictured here, was a precursor to today's log flume and featured a rather large final hill before splashing down into the water trough. Another legendary attraction was introduced in 1922, the Ravine Flyer. This coaster, built by concessionaire George Sinclair, was the epitome of roller coasters in their golden age. Designed by John Miller, the ride took advantage of the hilly terrain on which it was built and even crossed over Peninsula Drive twice during the course of the ride. The original station pictured here was set back at the north end of the park and delighted riders until 1938 when a tragic accident occurred on the ride. After an unexpected stop of the ride over Peninsula Drive, a young football player stood up on the ride to calm his hysterical sister in the seat behind him. He lost his balance and fell to his death. The accident caused so much stress for Alex Moeller's wife, Lydia Ruth, she demanded the ride be dismantled. The original station still stands today as Waldemere's Lakeview Picnic Shelter. Other attractions in this area include a miniature open train, the aerial swing, a caterpillar ride, and a walkthrough funhouse named Bluebeard's Castle. Even though there were other places to enjoy Lake Erie, Waldemere Beach was still a popular summer spot. The original boardwalk was replaced with a funicular that shuttled passengers to the lake named the Tunerville Trolley. Riders would disembark onto the beach, which included a bathing pool, pier, and slides. As the darkness of the depression faded, the drums of war sounded and World War II again brought challenges to Waldemere. Fuel rations and supply shortages left the park to improvise on many improvements during this time, such as paving the midways with scrap rubber. In addition to the challenges caused by war, another fire destroyed Another fire in 1941 destroyed the Hofbrau Beer Garden, killing a young lady who ran back into the burning building to retrieve her coat. Not only did Waldemere lose its beer garden during this time, but a series of storms in the 1940s washed away the remainder of Waldemere's beaches, forcing them to close. To stop the continued erosion, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers built a large break wall, preserving what was left of the beach. Despite these setbacks, Waldemere fully supported the war effort during this time and even renamed many of its attractions with patriotic themes. Shown here is the miniature train renamed the Victory Special. Toward the end of the 1940s, the north end of Waldemere's midway was dominated by a large concession stand and fun in the dark. This ride through dark ride replaced Bluebeard's Castle and was built by Pretzel Amusement Company out of Pittsburgh. Riders wound their way through a series of darkened rooms with mechanical gags that surprised riders. Other rides that made their debut in this decade were the Eyerly Aircraft's Lupo Plane, spinning riders upside down in true thrill ride fashion. Another classic, Waldemere's Bumper Cars, began entertaining riders at this time and still does to this day although the cars and buildings have been, have been updated. 
After wartime restrictions eased in the mid to late 1940s, Waldemere added new attractions, including the flying scooters and the whip. The flying scooters are still a popular attraction in other parks to this day, allowing riders to control the flight of their scooter with a fin. Along with Waldemere's first Ferris wheel, <clears throat> these three rides comprised a section of the park between the main Midway and Rainbow Gardens. Leading up to the 1950s, Waldemere's mill chute ride underwent a transformation, removing the steel, steep drop with a smaller version and renaming it Mill Run. As the nation entered the next decade, other changes could be seen as well. Children's rides had been around since the 1920s, but the post-war baby boom made them commonplace in amusement parks across the nation. Waldemere greatly expanded their children's rides in the 1950s and even relocated them to their own area of the park. Many of the rides that were introduced at this time are still operating today, including the wet boats, pony cart, and sky fighter rides. <clears throat> The 1940s and 50s were an important decade, were important decades for Waldemere's future success. Alex Moeller, who had been managing the park for almost two decades, made his goal of owning the park a reality in 1945, purchasing it from Marine Bank. In that same year, family friends of the Moeller's, the Nelsons, <laughs> brought an 11-year-old Paul to the park. Paul soon began working at the park during his summers, and Paul would live with the Mullers during the summer and work as a dishwasher and a restroom cleaner as his first jobs. By 1951, Paul was 17 and Waldemere began construction of another coaster, the Comet. This photo shows lumber for the project and forth from the left, a young Paul Nelson helping unload the shipment when he was supposed to be at football practice. This photo made its way into the local paper and when his coach saw Paul in it, he was not too happy. Philadelphia Toboggan Coasters, the leading manufacturer of coasters at this time, designed and built the ride featuring a curved station and a 37-foot drop. Since its installation, the Comet has been thrilling generations and still maintains the same station and facade when it was built. Waldemere continued to grow through the 1950s and 60s and added attractions that many of you have fond memories of. Rides such as the Flying Coaster, Scrambler, and Tilt Whirl were added in the early 1960s. Some attractions, however, met untimely ends. Alex Moeller felt that the Eli Bridge Ferris wheel that stood at the south end of the park would fit better at the north end of the park. He asked Paul Nelson, now the general manager of the park, to oversee moving of the ride. Instead of dismantling the ride and erecting it in its new location, Paul thought <clears throat> um, he could pick up the Ferris wheel with a crane and drive it down the park's midway. As the crane was driving, it hit a bump and both the Ferris wheel and the crane tipped over, destroying the ride. In the morning, Alex asked Paul if the project was complete and Paul simply replied, it is done. While Alex was unhappy with the result, he let that be a valuable lesson for Paul. In 1965, after over four decades with Waldemere, Alex Moeller passed away. In the, in the course of Alex and Paul's relationship, the Mullers adopted Paul into their family and upon Alex passing, Paul took ownership of the park. Alex was survived by his wife, Lydia Ruth, whom Paul took care of until her passing in 1977. The 1970s saw more iconic rides added to Waldemere's lineup. In 1970, Waldemere took on one of its largest post-war projects, the Wacky Shack. Designed by noted dark ride creator, Bill Tracy, the ride winds through various rooms with gags and special effects that give riders surprises around every corner. Its towering facade and unique quirkiness give the ride its legendary appeal with young and old. It is one of only six of Bill Tracy's original creations left in the US. The popularity of the Wacky Shack was astounding and two years later, Bill Tracy was contracted again to design yet another dark ride, the Pirate's Cove. Similar to the Wacky Shack, 
Pirate's Cove allowed riders instead to walk through the attraction, giving them an up close and personal experience to all the scenes and effects. In 1972, also saw the addition of Waldemere's train ride, named in honor of Lydia Ruth Moeller. The train engine, replicated after a CP Huntington engine, traveled around the entire park on a half mile loop, giving riders a full view of what the park had to offer. Since its installation, the original engine has been replaced by two newer models, allowing more riders to enjoy Ruth's namesake ride. Upon the death of Ruth Moeller, Paul's lifelong dream of owning Waldemere came true. In 1978, he installed the first ride as owner, the Sky Ride. This relaxing chairlift ride gave riders another perspective of the growing park, traveling from the north end of the Midway to the south and back again. Other attractions added in the early 1980s included bumper boats for both adults and kids. Despite these new attractions, Paul recognized the need for the park to invest and grow in order to compete in the attractions industry. Located in one of the densest amusement park areas in the nation at the time, Waldemere was surrounded by small privately owned parks as well as large corporate parks that were either investing and growing or shrinking and closing. Realizing the need to invest in the effort it would take to continue to grow Waldemere, Paul decided to double down on the growth and legacy of the park. With the emerging trend of water parks across the country, Paul decided to integrate a new water park to Waldemere's property, which was a relatively new concept at the time. <clears throat> in 1986, Waldemere began construction of the two body slides, the giant slides, and a few small act activity pools for children. Named Waterworld, this modest water park was an immediate hit. Seeing this, Waldemere continued to grow its water slide lineup. 1987 and 1988 saw the addition of the Bermuda Triangle, a three slide complex with a mirroring slide design. Extending Waterworld even more, another large sl slide complex was added featuring two more tube slides, Awesome Twosome and Midnight Plunge. The expansion in the 1980s did not come without sacrifices, however. <clears throat> Since 1905, Waldemere's original carousel had been delighting riders of all ages. But with the value of hand-carved carousels increasing due to interest from collectors, Waldemere decided to sell its, current, its carousel animals at auction in New York City. While this was a hard decision to make, the earnings from the auction raised over $1 million, which was used to fund the Waterworld expansion. And although most of the animals were purchased by collectors, two of the animals, a leaping horse and a stoic giraffe, were kept by Paul and still stand in his home today. The original carousel was replaced by a newer 60 horse model made by Chance Rides in Wichita, Kansas. In the early 1990s, Waldemere announced a 10-year expansion plan focusing on the amusement park rides in the early 90s included the Sea Dragon, the 100-foot Ferris wheel, and the Wipeout. As Waldemere's centennial anniversary approached, plans to install a signature attraction, Thunder River, Replacing the old mill ride, which had been in existence for over 70 years, Thunder River incorporated portions of the original water wheel in its design. Costing over $2.5 million, the ride features 1,300 feet of trough, a storm tunnel, and two large drops, the tallest being 40 feet. Once opened, the ride was an instant favorite and was just the sort of high profile attraction Waldemere needed. Following the success of the park's centennial year in 1996, additional real estate from the removal of the old mill ride allowed for another ride to be introduced. The Alibaba first soared overhead in 1999, taking riders on a magic carpet ride. 
Children were not forgotten at the end of the millennium either. Waldemere added two new family rides as well, the Frog Hopper and the Big Rigs. These rides, while mostly for children, allowed parents and grandparents to ride alongside their kids and grandkids, keeping with the family tradition of Waldemere. Since that time, all rides that have been added for children have been able to accommodate adults in order to keep families together while enjoying the park. The big rigs replaced the children's bumper boats and created a beautifully lush landscape for the ride to meander through. Waldemere continued to grow and expand at the end of the millennium. Along with new attractions, the park welcomed Paul's daughter, Nancy, and her husband, Steve, to the park's full-time staff. While Nancy had worked at the park growing up, Steve was new to Waldemere, having left a job at General Electric as a mechanical engineer and designer. While the attractions industry was new and unique to Steve, he was able to apply his past knowledge and learn quickly. He soon became the park's president in 2000. As the park progressed through its 10-year plan, the intention was to culminate with the construction of a new wooden coaster, Ravine Flyer 2. The design process, however, encountered setbacks, first from the bankruptcy of the designing company, Custom Coasters, and then from environmental concerns. To keep excitement and interest from the expected coaster, the first ride added in the new millennium was Ravine Flyer 3, a children's coaster. <clears throat> Set under the Ferris wheel and erected over the bumper boat pond, the flashy pink ride was a great addition for these young riders that wanted to conquer their first roller coaster. Waldemere's coaster count continued in 2005 with the addition of Steel Dragon, a steel spinning coaster. Costing over $4 million, this new attraction featured spinning cars on a crazy mouse style track with sharp twists and turns. The thrill ride tradition continued in 2007 with the addition of the X-Scream drop tower. Prior to its opening, Waldemere brought in a smaller portable model and set it up in the northern end of the park to gauge the attraction's popularity before installing the permanent version. The towering ride topped out at over 100 feet high, 140 feet high and let gravity pull riders to the ground in a free fall before stopping it with large magnets. After over 10 years of planning, countless designs and legal battles, construction on Waldemere's highly anticipated wooden coaster broke ground. Before construction of the actual ride could be started, much had to be done to ensure the site would be ready for the coaster. One of those projects, <clears throat> was construction of an access road along the base of Waldemere's northern slope. The creation of this road involved the erection of a retaining wall and allowed construction vehicles to access the full expanse of the site. Of those pieces of equipment were large excavators equipped with augers and pile drivers. Each of the 120 piers on which the ride was built needed to have three 60-foot long steel I-beams driven into the bedrock in order to support the structure. The most recognizable aspect of the ride also needed to be constructed before the coaster could be built. The erection of a 160-foot arched bridge over Peninsula Drive allowed for the coaster to replicate the original Ravine Flyers path. While the bridge aesthetics and color were dictated by regulations, the expanse was designed larger than the width of the road below to allow the possible future addition of a boulevard or bike path, a project that is currently being designed and discussed. At the end of construction in 2008, the Ravine Flyer 2 boasted a 120 foot first drop, three tunnels, a 90 degree banked turn, and became the largest wooden coaster in Pennsylvania. Today, Ravine Flyer 2 still holds the record in Pennsylvania as having the two highest drops. Costing over $10 million in total over the course of almost two decades, the opening of Ravine Flyer 2 was a major accomplishment and solidified Waldemere as a regional destination park. Riding the wave of success, 
and increased park attendance following Ravine Flyer 2, Waldemere focused on upgrading and adding attractions to the amusement park. 2009 saw the addition of the Mega Vortex, a 24 seat spinning ride that traveled on a half pipe style track located at the southernmost end of the Midway. At the opposite end of the park, in an area next to Ravine Flyer 2, the North End debuted three new attractions in 2011. The flying swings gave riders a chance to soar over the edge of the park property. Two additional family attractions, the SS Wally and Wendy's Tea Party, accompanied the flying swings. These rides were named after the park's two mascots, Wally and Wendy Bear. Rounding out the new area, the El Ruth Express train looped around the entire site, traveling under Ravine Flyer 2's massive lift hill. Two years later, another area of Waldemere's Midway saw an upgrade. 2013 brought a new attraction, a Himalaya-style ride, the Music Express, that featured loud pop music and high speeds. The area around the new ride was transformed as well, with the relocation of one of the park's oldest rides, the Scrambler, complete with a new LED light package and a new paint job. In the, and in classic Waldemere fashion, beautifully landscaped gardens and a new bronze statue were added to keep with Waldemere's natural historic beauty. After focusing on the amusement park expansion for almost two decades, the aging water park was needing an update. Since Waterworld's Water World's birth in the late 80s and early 90s, nothing new had been added to the water park. All that would change beginning in 2015. After purchasing the corner property on Peninsula Drive and 6th Street, where the inn at Presque Isle stood, Waldemere had the acreage it needed to expand its water park. The three-year expansion began with the construction of a massive wave pool. <clears throat> Covering over four acres and holding nearly 500,000 gallons of water, the pool features a peninsula, dividing it into two sections, allowing waves to be generated on one or both sides, depending on crowds. Included in this area was a new restroom facility, quick service food stand, over 30 dining tables, and over 1,000 lounge and sand chairs. The following year, 12 cabanas were added for rent, allowing guests to have a private area for themselves and their family, complete with food service and other amenities. That same year, Waterworld added another area catering to kids called Kid Zone. The shallow pool was a, with a sloped beach style entry held eight small slides, perfect for Waterworld's younger generation. In front of the pool, a state-of-the-art splash pad allowed younger children to experience a variety of sprays, squirts, and splashes in a zero-depth water area. On opening day of the new area, crowds were so large, the area met capacity in a matter of hours. In the last year of the water park's three-year expansion, Waldemere worked with the Erie Maritime Museum to design a new slide complex paying tribute to Erie's role in the War of 1812. Titled the Battle of Lake Erie, the complex featured seven slides, over 100 interactive water sprays, and three audio locations dictating different historic moments during the Battle of Lake Erie. At the top of the structure sits a large, characterized replica of Erie's flagship, the Brig, Brig Niagara, where a 400-gallon tipping buck, bucket hides ready to dump on unsuspecting patrons. Even though construction of the project wasn't completed until August of 2017, the excitement for the opening of the new area never wavered. <clears throat> the focus of 2018's new attractions saw the addition of yet another water world slide, the Cannon Bowl. <clears throat> Added to the existing structure where the awesome twosome and midnight plunge slides sat, Cannon Bowl wove through the existing slides and structures before dumping riders into a bowl feature, spinning round and round before plunging through the center into the pool below. While this slide was the focus of 2018, the amusement park was not forgotten. 
the addition of another family ride, Balloon Race, was added to the Kiddie Land section of the park as well. This year marked the first year of an expansion formula that Waldemere is continuing today. A main attraction in either the water park or amusement park with a complementing smaller attraction in the opposite park. 2019 kept with this formula by adding the most thrilling ride to its lineup in over a decade, Chaos. Spinning riders upside down over 60 feet in the air, this was the first ride at Waldemere in nearly 100 years to put riders upside down. The popularity of the ride was surprising and can be gauged by the number of screams that can be heard from up above. But in all honesty, it's a ride that I feel is much more enjoyable from the ground. <laughs> <clears throat> in the water park, a large heated relaxing pool was added to the wave pool area, allowing those more apt to relaxing at a water park a spot to do so. With no intention of slowing down, plans for a new attraction, plans for new attractions in 2020 began in the fall of 2019. The addition of a $4 million six-lane mat racer slide called Rally Racer and Waldemere's fifth coaster, Whirlwind, were on track to open for the park's 124th season. Unfortunately, the coronavirus pandemic delayed those plans and construction for the rally racer was not completed until July 2020. Despite the setback, <clears throat> this new attraction was met with excitement. Laying head first on a foam mat, riders can race their friends through two large looping and closed sl slides and two open rally sections ending with a photo finish. Located next to Peninsula Drive, this 45 foot structure and colorful slides surely draws the eyes of passing motorists on their way to enjoy our state park. Whirlwind was also met with laughs and screams in 2020. This compact figure eight tracked coasters features spinning cars much like our Steel Dragon. Traveling around the loop multiple times Children and adults can enjoy this ride together, located in the area where the Showtime Theater previously stood. <clears throat> Which brings us to present day. 2021 will be Waldemere's 125th operating season and should be met with new attractions and a celebration worthy of the park's rich history. Yet with setbacks, safety measures, and dramatically decreased attendance in 2020, new attractions will have to wait. Instead, we are looking for ways to improve the park and attractions for 2021 while also cutting expenses where we can. Waldemere has persevered through many challenging times and this will be no different. And uh, before we open up to any questions that you may have, if anyone is interested in learning more history or anecdotes about Waldemere, noted amusement park historian, Jim Futrell was kind enough to write a book about Waldemere's history that we have for sale at the park or on our website. The book includes many more photos of the park and even more descriptions of the park's history with a foreword by Paul Nelson. And if fiction is more your cup of tea, my younger brother, David Gorman, has written three fictional stories that take place at Waldemere. Geared toward young, young adults, the Waldemere Mystery File series features The Long Lost Locket, The Sneaky Sabotage, and The Curious Clues. These books can also be purchased at the park on our website or through Amazon. I'd like to thank um, again, the Hagen History Center for allowing me to tell Waldemere's story and I hope uh, you enjoyed it. Well, Brian, that was fantastic. I, the visuals and, and your commentary were just absolutely fantastic. I had three questions written down and you answered all of them. So I think that's a, a good sign. You're very complete, very thorough. Um, sort of wait a second and see if Sarah has any, uh, anyone who's sending a question, sure. she'll text those to me. But um, is there anything you'd like to say uh, in addition to your talk? I, I had no, I, I knew about the, the first Waldemere book by the Arcadia, mm -hmm. um, but I did not know about the mysteries. I, those are something my daughter would have loved when she was a little younger. Yeah, I mean, that even, I mean, I enjoy them as well. Um, David actually just, published uh, around the holidays, the third installment. Um, and it's, it's been fun to, to see that 
that journey that he's taken with these books. I mean, we've, we've got to read the, the, um, the drafts and, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a fun, it's a fun process. He does a lot, a lot of, uh, things with these books, with schools and libraries, um, since he's, sure. a, he's, a, he's a middle school guidance counselor in Virginia. So he, that's, that's one of his passions and he uses those books as tools, um, to do that. So I, I think that's, uh, that's fantastic. really fun. Yeah. We did have two questions that came in. Sure. Uh, first one is what year did the football player get killed on their main flyer? Oh my gosh, you're going to quiz me on that. I think it's um, 1937, 1937, 1938, yeah. Okay. Uh, next question, when did the trolley stop running? Ooh, that is a good question. When did the trolley stop running? I'm not sure if I know that or if I even want to guess for fear yeah. of spreading false information, but I did leave my email up there. And if anyone has a question that I can't answer, please feel free to email me and I will find the answer. There's, there's no answer I can't find. Promise. That would be a that would be a good choice for this uh, this viewer who had that question. And don't worry, we don't expect you to remember. You'll probably remember it five minutes after we. Yeah, aired. I do. I do know the trolley. The trolley uh, stop for Waldemere was right at the um, entrance to the park off of Sixth Street, next to the bumper cars. Um, so it came down. It came down um, our driveway, like I call it, off of Sixth Street, and uh, the stop was kind of in the parking lot there. Um, but as for when it stopped running, I don't know. Well, another question. Is there any particular attraction that was previously removed where guests would like to see it return? We Honestly, there haven't been many attractions that Waldemere has um, removed. I know that um, the old mill probably is one of the, the most iconic rides that Waldemere has taken out, I think. Um, I've had countless stories uh, from people, you know, and mostly older people that have, um, you know, met their um, husbands or wives on the ride or, you know, kissing their high school sweetheart in the tunnel. So that and that uh, ride was definitely one that um, was was missed by by the generation that got to enjoy that. Um, even I even I can remember a little glimpse of glimpses of it. Um, mm -hmm. Um, another question is, um, why doesn't the sky ride allow drop-offs at both ends of the park? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, Waldemere at that time, what, there wasn't much, uh, when it was put in, there wasn't much up at the south end of the park. Um, so to get off there, you really have to hike back to where the park was more north. Um, um, and right now there's, we've built so much around it. There's, it's not possible to do that anymore, but, um, one of my favorite rides as it, I don't know if anyone caught my little jab, but I, I don't do spinny rides or upside down things. So, <laughs> yeah, that was one of the questions. What's your favorite ride? And I tend to agree. I think I would enjoy that more from the ground than yes. I would taking it. Yeah. Yeah. So the I train, the train is definitely one of my favorites. Um, mm -hmm. and I like those, I like those easy rides. Are there any films of the park from the early days? Um, there, is, there was a um, documentary that was put on um, by WQLN um, um, before before the millennium, within the 90s. Um, and um, they have some footage of the park, um, you know, black and white footage of the park. Um, and I, I believe that it, it's still, um, floating around online. We might have it on our own YouTube page or at least mm -hmm. a link to it if you wanted to. It's um, amazing what that. you do find on YouTube. Yes. Even the old commercials and things. Um, wasn't there a miniature golf course at one time? There was. Um, and if I am re remembering stories correctly, I, th I believe it was near Pirate's Cove. <laughs> um, and then we did have a mini golf game over by the carousel as well that was taken out. Mm -hmm. Well, the questions seem to have stopped, and I just want to compliment you again on what an excellent talk. And I would like to apologize to you again to for all the um, delays and cancel cancellations we had to do because of the coronavirus. But I'm sure you you understand that what with dealing with this on a, on a much larger scale than, than we are. Of course, yes. No, it's not a problem. 
happy to, happy to talk about Waldemir. I could do it all day. Well, there's there is one more question. Do you collaborate or meet with other amusement park leadership like those from Idlewild in Ligonier or Kennywood in Pittsburgh? Yeah, so um, in the nice introduction that you um, gave, Jeff, um, you mentioned um, I am the current president of the Pennsylvania Amusement Park and Attractions um, Group in Pennsylvania. Um, so it's an organization of those parks that the uh, the question mentioned. Um, we meet in person twice a year um, at least and um, discuss anything under the sun um, relating to amusement parks. It's it's um, one thing I love about um, Waldemere and the amusement industry um, as a whole. It, there's so much collaboration. Um, and even though Kennywood is, you know, a two hour drive from us, um, we're still able to learn and feed off each other's um, ideas in order to um, present a, a good quality um, experience for the guests that come through our park. So, so yes, we do collaborate not only within Pennsylvania, but um, internationally as well. There's, there's an international organization that we're involved with as well. Um, it never ends all the information that we can get to try to make sure that we're doing the best we can um, to, to get that product, that nice product for people. No doubt. Paul, you alluded to this somewhat, Brian, excuse me, you alluded to this somewhat about uh, the environmental factors that sometimes go into creation of the, uh, of the rides. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so specifically Ravine Flyer 2 met those, um, environmental concerns um, from DEP um, and it was the concern was it uh, where the ride was being constructed is on a slope um, as it as the land falls toward um, the beachfront and the lake and um, <clears throat> the the concern was whether erosion and um, the construction of the piers that I mentioned would would lead to destruction or erosion of that slope. Um, so it, it was kind of a, a little bit of a legal thing, legal terminology. The DEP called that area a bluff and, um, you know, the other side was that it's called a quote slope. So, um, okay. I, again, we, I mean, we've done, we've done everything we can to make, to maintain that um, landscape underneath the coaster. Um, and even after um, over a decade, um, nothing, nothing detrimental um, has happened. So, um, good. Yeah. Well, we're going to end with one last question. Sure. Brian, I'm going to ask you, a, a, a viewer asked, what was your first job at the park? Um, well, Paul started at 11. And I, so I have to say, I started at 12. Um, but I was, I was, I was experienced in the park um, since I grew up in Erie. So um, I, I remember, oh my gosh, working in, in the office mostly since um, I was where they, where I was close to my parents and um, either, either, um, you know, counting some of the money that came in from the games and helping, helping the staff sort the money and count that. Um, or other small office tasks, um, but but honestly, I, I I grew up doing the the jobs that that someone might do. You know, I, I worked picnics as a fourteen and fifteen year old, served food, and um, uh, again worked worked in the water park as a lifeguard, and then in the ride department. So I feel like I got a good a good grasp of a lot of the areas of the park. Um, and even to this day, you know, operations encompasses almost everything. So um, you might catch me cleaning restrooms or sweeping the midway, um, in addition to the other things that I have to deal with. But um, yeah, that, that's probably my first memory: some some office tasks, sorting money with with uh, my grand grandparents. Well, Ryan, I'd like to thank you again. Um, what a very interesting talk, very well presented on the 125 year history of what is truly a regional landmark and a regional asset, Waldemere. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. Take care.
Yeah. And good night, everyone. We we'll remind you to join us again at the toward the end of the month on the 25th for the Civil War Roundtable Talk, in which I will present on General George Gordon Meade, Victor at Gettysburg, and Bud, Jeff Budworth from Gannon University will present on the 2020 election and its uh, resulting events. Thank you so much, everyone, and good night. <laughs>